It's going to be an exciting time ahead of us this year coming. Who's looking forward to next year? <laughs> Thank you. Obviously some aren't. I'm, I'm really sorry for the other 98% of you. <laughs> sorry, Donna? Yeah. We were in there praying this morning and we we're just sitting there for a while and we're giving thanks for the favour we found in God this year, all the good things that have been happening. I know people have had issues and hassles, but it's always great to say, well, we just want to thank you for everything. Walk with us through the times that are tough, but also, um, you know, sort of uh, just showing us what, you, you know, what we need to do and um, encouraging us in that. And I pray that your time here with us this morning will be encouraging and uh, in that regard as well. Well, because it is the last day, and we always got to talk about New Year's resolutions, just for a moment, because then we'll move on. They're not part of the message, but I thought it's good to pause. Who's put their name down for a gym membership <laughs> this year? Yeah, I'll give it. Thanks, Steve. I see you, brother. I see that, I see that hand. Yeah. yeah, I give up being a financial contributor to the gym years ago. Yeah. Now I found these couple of things that I think might encourage you. Oh, before I start, I've just got to show Ann Taylor and Matthew Taylor sent me this image on Facebook this morning. This is the church view from their church window this morning. And I thought, I wonder how many people really squeeze in for that seat near the window. And how much they actually, <laughs> if a whale goes past, oh look, there's a whale. Hang on, Jesus, there's a whale. Um, so I don't know which church it is or if it is in a church, but it looks like pews there and uh, a few other bits and pieces on the window. But yes, as 2017, 2018, we always make resolutions and I, I think this one sort of sums up the world as we know. December 31st, there's no one in the gym. January the 1st, there's heaps of people in the gym and uh, they all mean well to change their lives and to move on. They should have a January 2nd because then the gym would be back to the next one there because it's all too hard and it's all to go on a diet and things like that but I found this one that sums up things probably more appropriately in our world today you don't go to the gym didn't go to the gym today but the cashier's name at McDonald's was named Jim so they do the same thing and uh, I think unfortunately you're drawn to the, the golden archer sometimes and, and that sort of thing happens but folks I wonder if in your mind what you're thinking about this year. As you come into church, into our worship centre on Sunday, there's a sign above the door that says Gatton Baptist Church. And it's got these words, walking with God in the world. And we sometimes don't even see that up there. Sometimes we just look up, oh yeah, there's the building. But those words underneath are very important for us. It sums up what we're about. And, um, you know, walking with God and, and in the world is something that you know is, is close to Jesus' heart because that's what he did. And he walked with his heavenly father, but he also ministered in the world. We're going to talk a little bit about it today and we look at Acts. We're going to continue with Acts men. And um, I played around with a few graphics up here. I just wanted to show you how clever I am, just to sort of bring that emphasis to you. If you want to open your Bibles up to Acts 5, 12 to 17, and um, someone's obviously ringing the church in deep need, Richard, so we better make sure you answer that. Now we've been journeying through Acts, I looked back through my sermon notes, we haven't talked about or haven't consulted or read through or preached about or talked about Acts until like 26th of November I think was the last time. So we're continuing our series through Acts and um, we're going to keep having a look at them. We've just, the last time we, we have a look at the scriptures, Ananias and Sapphira had just been smited by the Holy Spirit and we looked at the ramifications of those sorts of things in life. So the church is sort of reeling a little bit from that. And we read on. It says, The apostles performed many miracles, signs and wonders amongst the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought back the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so at the least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those who tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Father, for the time we can spend in worship this morning. And Father, as we've been praying before, Lord, we pray for your spirit to fall upon us. 
Father, give us eyes and hearts to see your word today. Lord, the impact of what scripture means to us personally, Lord, as a body. Father, not just another message or another sermon, but Father, you speaking to us, and we expect to hear from you today. Lord, that's why we come. Father, we do thank you and praise you for your son Jesus who died on the cross for us, that we may live. And Lord, in all these things, Father, I pray that I speak your words, Lord, not mine. Amen. Quite an upheaval in time for the church because they were responding back from all the persecution that was happening. And how they responded is really interesting. They didn't go into their shells. They actually attacked things differently, approached church life differently. And I wonder sometimes if we, if we think about how we enact in church, whether or not we come to church because we want to uh, see what the church can do for us, or whether or not we come to worship God, and we come to worship God to make contact with him. We do that in all shapes and forms. In this passage, it was interesting how they responded to the, the, the recent persecution that was happening. You see, the believers met and others did, and I think that's an, an amazing sentence right at the start of that passage. The believers met and others didn't. They stood back and watched. And they watched. They were highly regarded, but they watched. And so as we have a bit of a look at this, we say perhaps they, some weren't comfortable. You see, in church life, there's a cost. In Matthew 16, it talks about laying, taking up your cross and denying yourself. To so these Christians wouldn't have been comfortable. So they would have been in this situation where you've got the Romans here, you've got the Jewish leaders here all pounding in on them, trying to make sure they don't spread this gospel message around. And in amongst all this, these guys met together. And they did it in Solomon's Colonnade. Now, Solomon's Colonnade is a very public place. It's a place where you stood out. This is where Peter spoke before, after he was addressed by the Sanhedrin. And so he went to this place, and because of that, we start to have an understanding about what it means to be in church for these folk. Because if the functionality of the church is very important. In Hebrews, in Hebrews it says these words, Let us not consider how we may spur one another on towards good and, and, good and, and good, love and good deeds, not giving up being together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all along, all the more as the day is approaching. If we're going to meet together, there's a couple of things we need to do. These guys met together, and here they are, all these things happening around them, and there's an outcome of this. And I think that if, when you're asked what is a healthy church, you need to have a think about how we understand that term. Is a healthy church one with a roof that doesn't leak? Carpets that are pristine. Is a healthy church got a wide doorway or a narrow doorway? In amongst us is the spiritual understanding of it all. And in Hebrews, when it says, don't give up meeting together, but encourage one another, that's the basic functionality of church. I said before, when you come to church, do you come to see what church can do for you, or what you, or you come to worship God? If you're coming to see what church can do for you, I'm really sorry. You might be disappointed. We call this place here we meet a worship centre because we come to worship God. We sing praises to him, we pray with him, to him, listen to him and afterwards we'll have a cuppa and we'll have encourage one another with discussion and conversation. We worship in giving, we worship in song and we worship in his word. So the functionality of the church is very important and how it impacts the local community. In 2 Timothy, it talks about scripture, and the scripture is so important as the basis for any church community. And so it says they're worshiping, praying, and training. That's what happens in churches, worship, praying, and training. In 2 Timothy, it says, and I'll read them out for you because I don't want you to be sort of confused, that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So all those things come out of scripture. Now let me just pause for a moment is useful for teaching. We accept teaching, don't we? It's also useful for rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. All three of those are in righteousness. That, to me, says that when we come, none of us are perfect. We come before God and we read his word to get better at being a believer, to get more focused at being a believer. No one walks through these doors wholly perfect. And so as the people come into this community, as they're there and they're speaking and praying and they're meeting together in the colonnade, they're worshipping and they're doing these things, they're healing because they're pointing to something more important. It's not about them. 
It was about them that would have run and hid, but it wasn't about them. Secondly, there's discipleship involved in the community of the church. It's about being together and being raised up in God. The hope in and prayer is that in every church family is that people come together and they encourage one another, but they also, because they understand God's word, they start to talk about that and how that can encourage your lives and change lives. So every person here is on a different level or a different step of maturity in faith. And that's understood. That's understood. But if you come along and you think, oh, I'm not good enough to do this, not good enough to do that, you miss the whole point. So as they came together, there was a whole heap of them and there was people watching what was going on. The other part about church membership and about church togetherness is about accountability. In Romans, it says these words. It says, As it is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Who keeps you accountable? If you're married, your spouse usually keeps you accountable. And that's a given. If you're a young person, your parents keep you accountable. But how do you work out your accountability to God? Because one of the things I suppose we struggle with the most is living our lives in such a way as when we mature and we start to get a few things together is who are we actually answerable to? The world looks at us, the people who don't know about God and understand God, see it as judgment. If you want to be in a really great relationship with a mentor, you let them make you accountable. I've got some material in my office that I use from time to time with people that uh, want to go through a mentoring process and, and there's some questions. I can't remember the author. He's quite a, a well-known author, but he put these... It might be Chuck Swindle. He put these things together and he says, "Have you?" and the questions you get to ask are these things. Have you um, sworn lately? Have you done something illegal lately? Have you looked at the pornography lately? And he goes through three or four questions and he says, and the last question is, have you just lied to me? Now, people say, oh, I love these, it'll keep me honest. They get to the last one and go, can we leave the last one out? If we leave the last one out, I'll be a bit more comfortable with it. See, accountability before God is like that. If you sit before God and you say, God, I need you to examine me and look at me. Is there any way that's not right as I come in to worship you? And that's not just on Sunday, it's every day. Because none of us are perfect, but we are forgiven. We're on a journey with God. And that accountability helps us to stay in focus with God. And I pray that you have found someone in your life to help keep you accountable. If you haven't, can I encourage you to pray about that? If you're going to make a difference for God in his kingdom and in this world we live in, this is a great time to start thinking about these things. And then it says that there was others watched from a distance. It was an interesting phrase there. I'll just read that from Scripture again because to me it just it was sort of, oh, this is really interesting. It says, um, no one else dared join them even though they were highly regarded by the people. No one else dared join them. How many times have you invited somebody to church and they haven't come? How many times have you invited somebody to your house for a barbecue and they didn't come? There's a lot of difference, isn't there? You can actually count up there. People love coming to a barbecue. You get fed at a barbecue. We have this thing that happens in youth group, and it's quite hilarious. The economy, the currency in youth group is chocolate. Okay, happens. It's really cool. And uh, we have to buy a lot of chocolate. But we said to the kids right at the start, Rachel set it all up. She said, now if you bring a friend, the friend gets a chocolate, but you also get a chocolate. They're not big ones, it's little chocolates. Otherwise, I'd know where they were hidden. Rach has to hide them from me. I have to do a quality control check. I don't want the kids having stale chocolate. And so, and so she has this situation. So anyway, the kids think this is great. They bring on, I bought this friend. We have two or three kids fighting over a friend. <laughs> oh, no, I bought him. No, I bought him. So, you know, we're pretty generous. <laughs> have a chockey. Have a chockey. We've got one boy. And he just, he just loves this new economy. And he has been bringing kids to youth group hand over fist and putting his hand up to get that chocolate. One day, I'm walking around, the kids are running around up here, they're running around upstairs up here like hooligans for about 10 minutes, and the projector moves over there somewhere because it bounces. And I saw him in the corner crying. I said, man, what's wrong? Someone hurt you or something? He said, no, my friend didn't come. 
I said, oh, man, isn't you hate it when friends let you down? But it's okay, we're all here for you. But I'm not going to get a chocolate. <laughs> people watch from a distance and they wonder sometimes what they can get out of it. There's several reasons why people watch from a distance. I know that in my ministry in the football club, I'm watched carefully from a distance for like three years before any conversations, before anything else got going. They were all watching to make sure they liked what I did and how I did it. They just weren't convinced that this God thing was okay. Sometimes people are fearful. I wonder if these guys in Anx had just seen what happened to Sephira and Ananias and went, whoa, dude, that's a heavy faith. You go there and you don't do the right thing, you get smitten or smoted or whatever that word is that they used to use in the Old Testament. In, and and you know, people say, if you don't do the right thing by this God or by Peter, you're just going to die on the spot. So I'm just not going to be part of that because I'm fearful of what might happen. And so fear keeps people away from faith. It keeps people away. They love to watch it all happening, but there's a fear inside them. When I was doing evangelism class a few years ago, quite a few years ago, it talked about building a bridge with people. So you build a bridge into their lives. So you make contact with them. You've got a common interest. You've got something happening and you make this and you go into their life and you build this bridge between faith and their existence. And that works really good until you try to get them to go back over the bridge because they think there's a toll or something on it. And so this whole thing about fear and what keeps people from being connected sometimes is quite frustrating. Because you hear people say, I've been praying for years and years for this person or my husband or whatever, and they're still not coming to faith. Man, what's going on? And someone else, they say, oh, we prayed for my whatever two weeks and boom, become a Christian. So where's God in that? So fear does keep people from being involved. They think they might have to change so much. I wasn't always the pristine and wonderful eloquently speaker that you see before you today. I once was a rough diamond. So rough, my first sermon went for 10 minutes. It was a youth exchange. And I got up in the middle of the service and everyone, we had wonderful musicians in our youth group. And, it was a, and I got up there and I got my notes and I started preaching. And I said, now we'll sing the last hymn. And one of the guys in the front from our church went, what? Oh, sorry. <laughs> it came out of his mouth. It went for 10 minutes. And I used to, oh, I had to make spelling mistakes and all sorts of things. <laughs> Don't use proper English. I know I'm being educated well. But see, all those things stop us from being because we think we have to be a certain way. And we, d we have people like this in our life all the time. It's not about that. And so these people looking in, and, and then one of my commentaries said they lacked courage. I thought that was a pretty game thing to put in there. They lacked courage to join up, to be part of it. And some people want enough evidence or they want proof. How do you get evidence and proof? Prove to me the Bible's not hypocritical. Prove to me where Adam and Eve's kids got their wives. Prove to me that the dinosaurs, why is there no unicorns in the Bible? All those sorts of things that people need, this, this cerebral thing, this thing that happened in their head, and really it's about their heart. But it doesn't matter, it's still real to them. And so people were sitting back and watching what was happening under the Solomon's colonnade, and they just really wanted to be part of it, but ah, this couldn't get there. And when it talks about 5.16, Matthew 5.16 talks about high regard. You know this verse? I try to learn this verse off by heart. I even tried it in a song, but I won't sing it for you. So I'll read it to you because it was a really cool song back in the 90s. It says, In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Now the word deeds in there is not your actions or your works. It's what God has called you to do. So if they see what God has called you to do and you do it faithfully, then that has an impact on their lives. And so high regard, they looked at what was happening and thought, man, this is awesome. I'm just not game enough to be in there. Perhaps we need to just praise it. It, that, they become gay. They become more courageous. And that happens. Philippians 2.13 talks about good works that reflect God. Good works that reflect God. It's not about how we do it, it's why we do it. 
And this group of people underneath Solomon's colonnade were doing what they were doing because that's what they'd been taught to do by Jesus and by God. And they were being faithful in that. And they weren't fearful They of being persecuted. They were trying to get their lives right with God and follow him. And then all through this stuff, there are people watching, wanting to be part of it. Want to be part of that happiness, part of that life. And it falls down from there. And in amongst all this, and this is how you know these guys were cool. Because there was growth. There was growth. And it says in these words up here, because they were going public, because they did this publicly, it was a public demonstration of their witness. Not a private one when they're doing their home between me and God. It's public. They're involved in ministry. They're involved in mission. And because of that, then they had an impact on the people around them. And this is how the Holy Spirit works. And I personally prayed before, Holy Spirit fall on this church. I pray that's our prayer every day is that we grasp what God's on about, not what we're on about. And so going public is a big thing. A couple of people came and saw me after church last Sunday. I forget which day it was. Now I think it's the 24th. We're talking about baptism. And a couple of these young people are going to come and saw me about baptism. And, and um, you know, I love baptisms because we can do it in two or three places. We can do it here in church. It means we invite people into a hallowed sanctuary. Or we can do it at someone's house at a pool and have a bit of a barbie afterwards, a bit of a yarn and maybe you know, a bit of sort of informal stuff might go on. People might feel like asking questions. Or we could have it in a creek where we catch a disease. So I'm really in favour of the pool idea. So maybe we might end up in a pool somewhere next, next couple of weeks. I don't know. Just want to keep your heads up for that one. But part of that whole situation is I ask people to go and be baptised, you need to write a testimony. Testimony goes for, you've got two versions. You've got the two-minute version and you've got the ten-minute version. Now, the two-minute version is the one that you share in church. The ten-minute one is if you get someone locked in a car with you and you're travelling for two or three hours. And they drive along on company and say, so you're a Christian. Oh, I'm glad you asked. Let me share my story with you. And you share with them and they can't get out of the car. But it's about the whole idea of the baptism. It's not so much the dunking of the bloop, bloop, bloop. It's about the public testimony. And going public and making it, wearing a public faith is very important to God. He doesn't want us to be hidden. And um, I found a scripture verse that um, I found a song from the 90s, 96 by Newsboys. I'm not going to sing it. And it says these words, and it's talking about people in faith who are struggling. It says, She's been dazed and induced, wants a part time God for a private use. But she won't take a stand because she might be tagged as a closet Christian fan. And the chorus says, sign on, the time is drawing near. This is surely a banner year. To be a public witness, sign on, the lines are drawn and clear. There's no straddling fences here. What a cool verse. We're going public with this. Then he's got a fellow's version. He's displaced and unglued, scared that faith in God could become misconstrued. But the cross makes him wish that his spine was more than a jellyfish. Sign on, the time is drawing near. This is surely a banner year to be a public witness. I wonder if we could be a public witness this year. More than we've been doing. A public witness to the town of Gatton. I mean, I love the valley. But man, we've got to sort Gatton out, eh? We've got to do something about Gatton. We need to pray for the people in Gatton. They'll come to know Jesus, Lord and Saviour. So when we go public, we need to make a statement about that and, uh, and keep moving through that situation. So they're going public because Jesus ministered in large crowds. Have you ever read through the Gospels? How many times do people come to faith in church, in synagogue? Hey, zero. How many people come to faith outside? Millions. Well, hyperbolate. A lot. But he was out in the, out in the public place. And because he was in a public place and he was ministering as he went, people, all they wanted to do was touch him. All they wanted to do was come into his presence. That, to me, says a lot about what we're on about, as we need to be public about this, because Jesus' ministry was public. It says in verse 14, they believed in the Lord. It says, large crowds came to faith and they believed in the Lord. So there's the stop off. Not that they, they ascribe to a religion or a style of worship or a style of church. They actually believed in God. If you want to have a prayer that you want to pray, pray that people believe in God. 
You can pray all sorts of things for them, but pray that they believe in God. They will find belief in God. They will find salvation through Jesus Christ. We can pray for them. They have a great day. We can pray for all sorts of things. We need to keep praying they believe in God. We can give them full bellies, but we need to pray they believe in God. We can help lots of people. We can help them to hell if we, they don't believe in God. They can be the best person in the world, but they will go to hell if they don't believe in God. And these guys are standing under the colonnade, underneath persecution happening all around. Everyone else is fearful. They're just being resolute for Jesus. And because of that, numbers were added. Heaps of people started coming to Jesus. And they were being healed, it says in Scripture, and all sorts of other things. The, the phrase added to happens three times in Acts and nowhere else in Scripture in that phrase. We've talked about the other two, and this is the last one, the third one. If you read through and look those up, write them down, and go home and have a look at your scriptures, and read through and find out what happened in conjunction with that phrase, there was lots of people. There was a pastor in the church when I was a young, younger Christian, and he got really cranky, and he said, why can't we be like an Acts church? He said, they prayed in faith, and 3,000 were added to their number. He said, we should have 3,000 in church. And he kept going on those several sermons in a row, which was quite interesting, different angles on it. And in the end he said, look, it's not happening, so obviously you guys don't get it. And I thought, ooh, okay. And it wasn't long after that he'd moved on to another church. And it was really like, it incited me to say, okay, how can I add 3,000? I was in charge of youth ministry in those days. And so I just changed the way we did youth group because we then made it more gospel-based, not fun and games-based. And guess what? Kids started coming to faith. It's just amazing when you get jinked by the Holy Spirit, what can happen in your life. And so they were added to the number. Things were happening. And it's not just the numbers, but the thing we need to get understanding. It's what people get scared of. And I just want to be very clear about this, because God is, going to do, is doing a work in our church, and this next year is going to explode. Because it's not about increasing the numbers here in the seats, it's increasing the numbers in the kingdom. That's what we should be on about in 2018, 2019, 2020, is about increasing the kingdom. If we need to knock walls out, move church, whatever it is needs to do that, we need to do that. But we need to increase the numbers in the kingdom. And that is what we're called to do. That is what these guys were called. They didn't realise it. They're meeting under Solomon's colonnade and doing their thing, and people are being added to it. And they're going away and telling other people about Jesus. And the, the greatest thing about it, though, is a positive experience. One of the things I try to encourage the worship team to do and I encourage other people to do is that when people come to church and they're not used to coming to church, they need to come with a positive experience. If they leave here, if they're unchurched and they leave here with a positive experience, they will come back again. If they come and have a negative experience here or something doesn't sit right or just doesn't work, then they're not going to come back. And so the fellowship they miss out on can rest on that. It's so important we address having our cup of tea the right way. We just encourage people to be around. We find people. We look around the congregation. Well, that person's new. I'm making a beeline for them. Now, if you're new here today, I do apologise. You're going to be inundated in a few minutes. But just keep smiling and nodding. Is it about that positive experience? It's so important. I stand at the... So time's up. Let's break. <laughs> I stand at the door and I shake people's hand as they leave. Sometimes I have to sprint from here out there to catch them because I see them leaving during the last song. I always you know, shake the hands. How are you going? Thanks for coming today. And I try to get a conversation out of them for a few moments as they're walking past me towards the door. And I say, yeah, how are things there? Did you enjoy work? How did you contact it? Oh, yeah, it was lovely. Didn't like the songs. And there were all these, some people have criticism. That's fine. You're allowed to. Some people say, yeah, I love the singing. Other people say, oh, I didn't agree with what you said in that passage of scripture. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. But the whole thing is about making that connection. It's a positive experience. And the missional impact is absolutely extraordinary because in Acts 1.8, just earlier on, we'd read last year sometime, that it says that my Holy Spirit will fall upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and the ends of the earth. So it starts close to home. It starts close to home. Holy Spirit falls upon the first place. 
and the ripple effects go out from there. And because of this missional impact, these guys are starting to win people to Jesus, they're starting to show people about faith, they're starting to talk to you about Jesus, what it means to have him in their life, how to follow the faith. And then people start to be drawn. People start to be drawn. In Luke, this passage is really wonderful. It says that people come from the east and the west, the north and the south, and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. They come from everywhere. They were drawn to it. Some people have a personality that draws others. Some people have a personality that doesn't draw others. We can't be a judge on that. It's God's got to work through that one. But we can be responsible for what happens here as a family. I have a, a Gatton Baptist sticker on my, my four-wheel drive. Um, and we were driving the other day, Shri and I, and something happened and I was going to do something. And she said, good job you didn't do that. And I thought, yeah, I know, I've got a church sticker on me. <laughs> yeah. But it just makes you think about we're responsible for so much. I've still got 150 stickers if you're game. You want to make a statement for Jesus. You put it there and you can explain to the officer when he pulls you over. I was on my way to church. I got pulled up one day going to a pastor's retreat over through Beer Wall. There's a little sneaky section. I was doing 80 into a 60 zone. The policeman just waved me over. He said, what are you doing? Anyway, I told him, and he said, I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to a pastor's retreat. <laughs> to be with other pastors. And he went, really? <laughs> I said, yeah, we're not perfect, just forgiven. And um, <laughs> I was trying to think of all the cliches in the world. And the guy, he looked at me, just shook his head. He said, oh, mate, I feel for you. <laughs> he said, here, and gave me a warning. <laughs> and I thought, oh, be honest every time. <laughs> be honest every time. Message, message. Oh, don't speed and be honest. Listening, Tim, Rue, where are you? Griff. Oh, Griff, you drive a Land Rover. It's all right. You have caught speeding. And so people were being drawn everywhere to this wonderful banquet. And that's the vision we have of heaven, and the vision we have of the kingdom. As I said, Jesus' ministry is in the marketplace, and because of that, people's spiritual needs were met. See, they were healing them basically, they were doing the healing stuff, but there's a spiritual interaction. And we can't forget that. We can't overlook that's the thing that happens, is about the spiritual understanding. Second last thing the church is for building and sending. The church isn't the building, and I've had some people say, well, the church are the people, and that's what it says in Scripture. But the church, coming to church, is for building. It's for getting people up and going. It's for recharging. It's for getting them in the right direction. It's for helping them, discipleship. It's for making a difference in their lives. The prayer that we have every Sunday is that people will leave differently to when they came. Sometimes we think that about our homes. We think, oh, people came, did they have a good time? They leave differently when they came? If you come to our house, you're meted by three canines, met by three canines, meted, met by three canines who bark. They're outside, but they bark through the house to greet people. Sometimes I wonder if that leaves a positive image. One day I'll let the door open and let the dogs love them. And so it's for building up. And build on the basis to equip the saints. That's what it says in Scripture today. To build on the basis to equip the saints. If you don't feel equipped, you come and see me. Pastor Doug, I need more equipping. And we will do something about it. If you think, no, nah, I'm good. Good on you. I'll send someone to you. You can equip them. There is a passage in scripture here. I'm just about to finish up now. So we've um, got two more slides. So worship team can be on the roll. <laughs> if, where it says in this passage of scripture, if you picked it up, it says, well, people were laying their sick down so that, so that even the shadow of Paul's coat would pass over them and heal them. Now the word or the word in that phrase is episkazio, episkazio, and the Greek that means the overshadowing of God's presence. You want to write something down that's going to be important for this year and for the rest of your life. Write down the overshadowing of God's presence. You might not want to remember the Greek, but write that down because I think that signifies what was happening. This community of believers was doing what they were doing because they're overshadowed by God's presence. It wasn't them, it was God's presence in their life. And because of that, it had a kingdom impact. I don't know if you were here on the 24th, but I was reading some stuff that I found um, that they'd put online about um, the nativity scenes in shopping centres. Mark McCrindle, who is a Christian statistician, he looks at numbers, he, um, 
he, he had all these facts and figures that he'd done and he came up with this after doing a survey that 91% of people that weren't of Christian faith necessarily agreed that the story of Christmas was important and should be maintained. You see, people need hope. We think that people don't want to know about Jesus, but in their lives are so confused. And the people standing back at the colonnade watching, their lives are confused. They were limited by the humanity. They need hope. They need to be able to connect with a Lord that loves them, a saviour that will save them. And that is what's happening there. And if you think of that one little stat, think about how people observe what's going on in the life of the church and in your life. How does that make a difference? In 2018, we need to be in the overshadowing of God's presence. That's the thought I'm going to leave with you today. It may be a prayer that you can pray, Lord, just help me to understand what this is about. Lord, how can I be of better impact for your kingdom? Heavenly Father, how can I just contact that and how can I really get into that for you? That your, that your presence will be in my life like it's over as a shadow. The second part of this message will be next week, in the world. I know you think I've spoken about it already, but God's funny like that. He has more in store. Can I just say one thing, and I just want to encourage you, that bringing a person to church won't save them. They need Jesus. Bring them here. You may hear the gospel. I try to put a gospel message in nearly every week. But a lot more happens before they get to here for fellowship. So if you're a lazy Christian and you don't share the gospel, you don't share your faith, you just keep inviting people to church hoping they will find it, you need to have a look at yourself again and where you are with Christ. Because you can't, don't, don't rely on this building. Think about what God has put in your heart to share. Overshadowing of God's presence. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Father, that you cared enough, Lord, to set things up in Scripture that we can learn from it. Father, we pray for just the overshadowing of your presence in our life. That, Father, you give us eyes to see and ears to hear the hopelessness of those around us. That, Father, we can connect with them. Lord, just keep us, help us, Lord, just to keep chipping away at that crusty exterior. Lord, we pray for opportunities to share our faith. Lord, to share it in a real way. Lord, let's be authentic about it. That, Father, that we can just do as the guys did under the colonnade. Lord, just standing and doing what you called them to do and people were being added to their number because they wanted to know about you. Father, we pray that this as a church as we go through into the next year, that, Lord, that we will grasp what you've called us to do. Father, we will make a difference for your kingdom because of your son Jesus and what he made for us. Lord, we thank you. It's in your name. Amen.